Zubin, welcome back. David, it's always a joy, man. So we're going to talk about the topic that everyone is talking about right now, which is Joe Rogan, censorship, medical misinformation. And it touches on so many of the topics that we've been talking about for quite a while since we first connected last summer. The the nature of the kind of information ecosystem, which is, I think, the biggest frame and the most important perspective, like the, the search for truth together. How do we know what's true? What are the checks and balances? How is the mainstream stopping that? And I think a lot of, like the, the biggest thing to, to, to maybe flag at the beginning is like, Rogan is so important because he's more trusted than just about any of our institutions. And the institutions, I don't think, have started to wrestle with why that might be. While I think there are other ethical issues as, as well, like that's right at the core of it, I'd say. Yeah, I, th- I think that's right. I think, you know, when I think about Rogan, when I watch Rogan, and <clears throat> remember my biases are, I'm trained in the medical industrial complex, you know, th- through the whatever elite institutions that that comprises. But I, a- as part of that whole process, really saw the underbelly of it the reductionism, the sense that you can do a bunch of stuff to people to get them to be better, but not re- you're not really doing stuff for people. And it's not a very holistic way of thinking. There is a profit motive. There is a general um, left brain kind of approach to the whole thing, which is take a whole, reduce it to its pieces, and then try to reconstruct a whole from the pieces. So that my bias was always, oh, that never felt right. And that's part of the reason I got out of that system built my own clinic, did some other things, then started my show, but I'm still conditioned in that system. So I can see from that perspective and I see also from a a rather different perspective. So when I see Rogan, as somebody who myself does this kind of thing, podcasting and video podcasting, I mean, I see see pure authenticity, (laughs) like meaning he is himself. that's at least how it's conveyed. You can, you know, you can intuit only so much through video, but the way they even frame his shots, the way that he has a body of work, the way that he talks for three hours at a time, you are forced, if unless you're looking at clips, you're forced into a contextual understanding of this guy. And that contextual understanding is so broad and deep that most humans, I think, will pick up that, no, this guy at least means what he says. He's not lying to you. And he's looking for truth. He's trying to synthesize truth. And you can, <clears throat> so so that's that side of, of me, that communicator side can see that in him and the human side can see that in him. The conditioned medical side sees that in him too, but then also sees where he goes wrong in terms of his thinking, um, being a little more, more than a little more sort of uh, inclined towards the conspiratorial and the fact that, listen, because these things are true, these things are wrong with say healthcare or our system, these other things also must be true. And I I think that's not necessarily the case. So that side of my conditioning sees that. So when I look at Rogan, it is this very complex thing. Um, And I'll say this, I admire him. Like I actually think he's doing great work when he shows unopposed kind of stuff on the antithesis side of the COVID argument, I just wish he'd show more of the other arguments, right? But other than that, you know, he's a brilliant communicator. I think people trust him because he feels very honest. Yeah, and we'll come to, I mean, he's got most of the criticism, I think, but for the two episodes with Robert Malone and Peter McCullough, and we'll maybe come to that a little bit, but not get too dog, kind of bogged down in the detail. I think it's there's much more interesting things to talk about. And you already mentioned the thesis position. So we're going to use, roughly speaking, the the kind of distinction that came from Peter Lindbergh, thesis and antithesis perspective, thesis being more of the mainstream narrative, antithesis being more of the kind of challenging narrative. And my my big feeling, and I'd like to play a clip now, actually, from CNN um, that we watched just before we started recording, because I think it just illustrates so much the problem with the extreme thesis mainstream perspective on Rogan. People who are listening to Joe Rogan's podcast don't necessarily believe it to be bad information. So uh, there was an analogy drawn between Doritos and Joe Rogan's podcast. Uh, people know that Doritos are not necessarily good for them. Uh, that You're not going to find a nutritional expert who says, you know, you should eat a lot of Doritos. 
But there are a lot of people who listen to Joe Rogan's podcast who believe that he's actually the, the truth teller. They, they believe the opposite, that, that Joe Rogan is good for an informational diet. And I think that's what's so important is that the people who are listening to him don't believe it to be bad information. So it, it's difficult, I guess, for them to make that, uh, that choice, that good choice uh, uh, of uh, consuming information when they, they think that uh, the, the podcast hosting people with anti-vaccine rhetoric is really the, uh, the truth-telling podcast. Kat, you made the Doritos reference. I, I rather liked it. What do you say to Oliver? Um, I mean, I think that it just ultimately comes down to the question of how do you want to solve this? You know, and that's sort of where the analogy comes in. You know, here's people who, you know, they like something that we, you know, who consider ourselves more enlightened, don't think is good for them. Um, you know, we think that they're internalizing this misinformation, that they're using it to make bad decisions. Um, but if you took away Joe Rogan by deplatforming him, just as if you, you know, took away Doritos, it's, would they seek out better information? Would they seek out, you know, like a podcast? like New York Times, The Daily, or, you know, would they start reading the Wall Street Journal? I don't know. I, I think that that's sort of the fundamental question here. If, if there's one clip that kind of just illustrates they really don't get it, they really don't get why people don't trust what they say, they don't get why people respect someone like Joe Rogan, I just cannot understand why people are not realizing that that kind of dismissiveness is exactly what's creating a lot of the things that they seem to kind of, well, they say they don't want, but who knows? Yeah, man. When when <laughs> it, it it's funny because I I can actually see into some of the stuff, especially the 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 female uh, correspondent. I don't know who these people are, honestly. And and so there's there's that piece of it. So you're taking out of context something probably that maybe they had a discussion that was longer and more nuanced off camera or something. It's hard to say, but I'll tell you the sound bites they used. It is exactly that. It's that blindness of the thesis position, which is that. Man, you know, as enlightened people who really are in the know, and, and and I'll tell you this, a lot of doctors feel this way. They feel into that thesis position, like, look, guys, like, like we know a lot about this stuff, and I don't understand why anyone believes anything they see on Rogan, because it takes us five minutes of watching to go, dude, that's kooky. Like, there's every reason to distrust this. But if that's true, if you really feel that way, you better feel into why people are listening to Joe, and it's not about him being the Doritos, like the trashy, like Maury Povich in America. We had these like horrible talk shows that were sensationalized. That's not what Joe is. Joe is like a conversation that is very authentic and it comes with a certain bias, that's fine. But there are really in-depth, long form conversations that these guys just clearly don't understand. They clearly are just not watching it or they're so blind in their own position. Um, that they can't see it. And so anybody who sees that clip that is even, even wavering towards antithesis is gonna go full antithesis because it's just exactly the kind of elite nonsense that, that is un, people find untrustworthy. And, and, and you know, David, it like pulls, it pulls the actual real expertise of people who actually know a lot about this stuff, like say whether it's vaccines or epidemiology or whatever it is, it pulls it into deep disrepute. Into, into a lot of untrustworthiness along with it. So you have idiots like that, again, and I, I, it gets me really fired up because they, these people should know better how to communicate. You have people like this that are doing this behavior on a major mainstream uh, uh, television pro news program. And it is, it is directly affecting the trust that people have in any institutions that some of which actually have large trustworthy elements in them. So it's a huge problem, man. Mm. Yeah. And it kind of cuts to the heart of the issue that, that I've been feeling since kind of looking into this stuff since last summer is that because it's like, what is responsible heterodoxy as well? This whole question around there is responsible heterodoxy. I, I see it when I, when I look at some of the doctors who are like yourself, like, Vinay Prasad, like Marty McCarry, who you've had on before, some of these figures who are questioning a lot of the, the mainstream narratives, a lot of the sort of the CDC straight down the line narrative, the thesis position, without drifting into kind of falling off the road on the other side. And my sense is that because, it, in a way, a lot of this is self-created by the thesis institutions, by the way that they're manipulating the conversation, the way that they're shutting down genuine heterodox points, genuinely valid criticisms, 
it then opens up the possibility for people like Malone and McCullough and others to exploit those genuine perspectives around some of the criticisms of um, the COVID landscape to then go overboard and slip in what kind of certainly amounts to unsubstantiated or unsupported claims and probably veers into misinformation or disinformation at its kind of at its worst. It does. It it what it does is it creates a vacuum of trust that then is filled by people with credentials that can speak very clearly, that are very good communicators, that again, some of what they're saying is absolutely spot on and needs to be heard. And, and then that's interlaced with stuff that I would say is not accurate. So it it creates, you know, you, you mentioned responsible heterodoxy. See, you you can have a communication of a thesis position that is so nuanced, that is actually so nuanced that it's more of a synthesis position. And, and, and a doctor, you mentioned Mar Marty McCary, Vinay Prasad, they're very heterodox docs and they come out hard swinging. They're great communicators. They really take what the mainstream is missing and they drill on it. They're like, here's what you guys are missing, whether it's you know myocarditis, whether it's closing schools, whether it's masking children, all the things that I think we're gonna look back on and go, that was an atrocity, right? Um, they, they're passionate about that. Yeah, and you're already sort of pointing to this sort of gap between kind of heterodox or alternative and, and mainstream, which is something I've talked about as the kind of uncanny valley between the two. And the irony is, I think that Ro Rogan actually, just by sheer size of podcast, does bridge the gap. So you've mm -hmm. got, I've kind of talked about the uncanny valley as you've got the mainstream, which is kind of debate within sort of very narrow parameters, then you've got the alternative, which is often kind of contrarian, but there's no incentive structure often to challenge. There's no incentive structure to, like people can have podcasts where they, they never actually get anyone on who disagrees with their perspective. And a lot of these figures, like I, I think I, you, you saw the piece that I put out recently called The Religious Wars of the Pandemic Endgame. And one of the lines in that was, just the simple fact that Robert Malone has got to over half a million Twitter followers, huge millions and millions of views, probably hundreds of thousands of people making medical decisions, partly influenced by someone like Robert Malone. And he's never had a challenging interview. He's never had a debate with anyone qualified to challenge him. That for me, whatever the reasons for that, simply show that the ecosystem is completely broken. And, and then you've got him on Joe Rogan and Joe, um, yeah, Joe's would, would never claim to be qualified to try and challenge someone who, who's got kind of the medical background and saying the sort of stuff that, that Malone is. But as, a, as an illustration of a broken ecosystem, that I think has to be near the top. Yeah, this idea that each perspective gets its own echo chamber and never the twain shall meet. So there is no you know, as Peter calls it, Peter Lindbergh, the synthesis position. There's no bridging the, you know, you you did a you did a wonderful interview with Ian McGilchrist that um, I thought really identified this idea, the split between right brain, holistic, contextual thinking and left brain, picking things apart and grasping and the left brain really is sure it's right. Like it's, it's always, it's confab, it makes up stories that it, it just has to be right. Whereas the right brain is kind of like, I don't know, there's a lot of nuance here. It's a little more pessimistic. What, what ties the two brains is that corpus callosum, those fibers that inhibit and connect each other side. So when one gets a little crazy, the other will inhibit it. Um, and even though it only lands on 2% of your total neurons, it has this huge effect because when you cut it, you see these really remarkable deficits. Well. What we have now is we have a thesis and an antithesis side, and there's no corpus callosum connecting them. There's no sense maker that can integrate this in a way that makes sense. For example, Robert Malone, very smart guy, had some real contributions to the mRNA technology. And I had uh, Dr. Paul Offit on my show, who's more of a synthesis guy, although lately, and we, sh we should talk about this because lately he's been branded as an anti-vaxxer by the thesis guys, because he dared to violate the orthodoxy that every young person should get a booster 
for coronavirus. He said, I told my teenage or my um, 20 year old something son not to get a booster. He doesn't need it. He's already protected against. Now this is the most pro vaccine person you will ever find. So I had him on the show and we were talking about Robert Malone and he said, here's what Robert Malone did. And here's all the things he didn't do. So he has a very nuanced way of looking at it. Now, if you got Paul and Robert to talk about these issues and, and Robert Malone brought up these things, Paul would be one of the few people in the thesis side who could go toe to toe without losing his mind or being disrespectful. And I think um, that's a conversation we, we never see. We don't see them together. I'd love to bring it back just a little bit to whether we've got any thoughts on what responsible heterodoxy might look like or how that might be a kind of um, a way of dealing with the information landscape crisis, the kind of crisis of truth, the sense-making crisis. I mean, one of the, uh, one of the thoughts that I had was hosting dialogues between sort of to find sort of what is the responsible heterodoxy. It's kind of, for me, it's about how do you pass that 80-20? How, how do you work out that 80-20 of the 80% where the antithesis is a valid and useful and essential criticism of the thesis position without smuggling in that last 20% where it goes off the rails into the ditch on the other side, basically? Yeah. Boy, I mean, this is the really tough thing, you, 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 you kind of would assume that people in that heterodox space that are doing this work are someone like Rogan, who is a contextual thinker for the most part, and who is able to make those synthesizing, you know, corpus callosum fibers bind between different ideas. And I think in a way we need, we need a, a, a some kind of incentive structure that rewards that kind of critical thinking and synthesizing behavior. And I don't know what it is. I don't have the answer. I'd say that every time I talk to you, David, I come up with, it, it, I'm always like enlightened in some measure onto, first of all, what the, new, what the problems are that I'm not even seeing. And the second is what some possible angles of solution might be like when Peter Lindbergh talks about a synthesis position or the kind of debate structures that actually look for truth instead of the rivalrous dynamics and the winner and loser dynamics and so on. So, you know, people that you have in your course and on your show, like Daniel Schmackenberger and others that are really thinking about this, I think we need to listen to them because um, I'm certainly not smart enough to come up with those. But once someone comes up with them, I'm totally willing to study at their feet and figure out how can I do a show that actually incorporates some of that synthesis technique better. And I think it assumes good faith, good intent, and an understanding of our own bias and putting it out there very clearly and also being willing to admit when we just don't know what we're doing. That, that's one thing that, that Joe is really good at. Like if we're talking about the soul of Joe Rogan, like in his soul, he's like, oh, man, sometimes I just don't know what the hell I'm talking about. And so you can see that as an excuse, he's trying to absolve himself, but you could also go, you know, I think he really thinks that. That's why he's so curious. That's why he's always asking. But again, self-reflecting when maybe he's, he's more certain than he, then he has a good reason to be. That's a, that's a tough thing to catch in any of us. Yeah, genuine curiosity is so rare. And so rare in the mainstream media, especially. Like <laughs> that, that, that more than anything, that kind of personality trap that I think so many people in the mainstream fall into is like, I, I, I need to know about this. I need to project that I know about this thing is, is the biggest trap. And it kind of traps people in this kind of performative mode. And so much of the media that you saw with the CNN clip that we played at the beginning, it's like people are totally done with more than anything. It's like this sort of bringing it sort of almost like a spiritual dimension in. It's this sense of everyone wearing a mask and pretending and performing. And Joe Rogan isn't. Like that's ultimately, I think, what has led him to be trusted in the way that he has and what he does with that trust now. I think is really up to him. I I believe I believe he's in a difficult position because of the amount of props that he's getting for being king of the antithesis position. But it would be fascinating to see, like, in, in a way, a lot of a lot of this is now kind of based on Joe's own kind of inner ethical sense, um, which is why yeah. I talked about it being a kind of like a battle for his soul in some way. And you can kind of see the different angels on his shoulder and maybe kind of give them names if we want to, but it's, it's fascinating.
Yeah, that's beautifully put. I think that's right. It really is. And you can feel you can feel some of his own struggle even when he talks about it on his own show with uh, the comedian that he spoke with about, you know, the, this sort of stuff. You know, one, one, one thing that, again, I, not to keep rambling about this, but a really fascinating conversation I remember, and it's been a long time since I've seen it, was Joe Rogan talking to Sam Harris on Joe's show. And that conversation was like two creator heterodox um community creators, intellectual dark web, whatever you want to label it, talking shop. And it was almost like they didn't remember the camera or the audio was rolling. And it was, they were the, just it was the one stuff. it was the one just after the Jack Dorsey interview, wasn't it? Oh, it might have been. It might have been. Uh I'd have to remember. But I remember just going, wow, that is an authentic conversation about what they're trying to do in the world and how they can do it. Um, I'm pretty and I think, sure. Yeah, I'm pretty is sure. It, was, it was, was it after Dorsey? Yeah, because that's why Joe, I think, brought him on was he'd had this catastrophic interview with Jack Dorsey, and he was like, so in that he was sort of saying, "I'm wrestling now. My audience basically kind of had a go at me in a way that I've never experienced before, and I don't. And I, I'm kind of realizing I've got all of these new responsibilities, and I don't know what to do about it. I think that was. It sounds like it was probably that one. But I got accused of everything from being a shill to being a cuck, yeah. to being a, and there's also an issue that you've managed to avoid, wisely so, of advertising. The cash apps and advertiser on my podcast. So because the cash apps and advertisers are on my podcast. Right, right. The man had you by the throat. Exactly. Yeah, you think couldn't that. ask all those great questions that were queued up. The reality is, uh, those are the questions I would have asked. Right. Now that's hard to say, because no one's gonna believe it, but those are the questions I would have asked. And I tried not to be too confrontational with a guest, but, yeah. In hindsight, I probably could have pressed more, particularly on people like Kathy Griffin uh, calling for doxing for the, right. the, the the kid with the MAGA hat on with the Native American. There was there's a quite a few. That might be worth a rewatch. Um, I'll have to watch that again because I just remember watching that as a creator and just it was like you know eating popcorn and just learning from these two guys and uh, and and I remember thinking wow, I love both of them so much more having seen this because they seem genuinely to be so self-aware about what they're doing. And I think that's what we want. We want to reward that, like that kind of self-awareness. Um, it's so unusual, like you said, in the facade that you see on a CNN or a Fox or these sound bites where it's just so artificial and people now have authenticity on hand in the internet. They see people screw up on YouTube. They see, you know, this is, you know, even somebody like, something like Breaking Points, which is, it's more scripted and and they're talking heads, but they, they go at it in a way that's a little longer form and feels more authentic. I think maybe that's a good midway point where we get there. I'm kind of a reluctant, student of digital media now because I've just kind of stumbled into this wild west that, you know, you in large part have invented, right? I mean, this podcasting space was nothing. And now we've got Spotify, you know, buying up, you know, it's just like a land grab for audio. Yeah. The, we were and talking it, about that before the podcast. They just purchased some company. Was it Gim? What is it called? Gim yeah, Gimlet. Gimlet. Yeah. For yeah. some un godly amount of money. Yeah. Yeah. Like $200 yeah. million dollars and they're going to spend 500 this year or something. And so it's, it's this, we're, we're all just making this up. I host people like Marty McCary, Vinay Prasad, Monica Gandhi, Jay Bhattacharya is another doctor who's been very sympathetic to antith antithesis viewpoints that our lockdowns, our response to COVID has been way out of proportion to the damage we're doing with the response because so on and so forth. So there was an open letter written to me by one of the bloggers at Science-Based Medicine, which is a big sort of <clears throat> pro-science skeptic blog. And it basically said, look, you're, you're hosting contrarians that are costing lives by generating anti-vaccine sentiment. We you know, are asking that you stop doing it and so on. How is that gonna work? So now you're ostracized by the thesis tribe for daring to question the orthodoxy, even though in every show I do, I say, you know what? I think it's a really good idea you get vaccinated and people email me all the time. I got vaccinated because I trusted you and I don't trust these guys because you're actually nuanced about it. So this is the problem. You know, they, they, they're behaving like this hive group think and it's it's more tribal than it is actually looking for sense. Yeah, and just you mentioned the Paul Offit interview that you did recently, which I think is worth flagging up and maybe if people are watching this and haven't seen it, to go and watch it because it was a real moment knowing of Paul Offit from you as this kind of 
one of the the most um, vaccine pro vaccine doctors around, and he was at the end of his tether. Like he basically, I'm paraphrasing, but he was basically saying that the way that we've treated public health during this pandemic has destroyed and has rightly destroyed faith in public health for a generation. Maybe you could sort of summarize what his perspective was, because suddenly I would probably not have put him in the heterodox camp up until up until now. But right now he's kind of basically saying the thesis have lost the plot completely. Absolutely. And and the wonderful thing about Paul is he is a guy who is actually a quite a free thinker. And even the fact that he'll come on a show like mine, you know, is very powerful because he's a regular on CNN and these other things, right? So you'd think, oh, you know, what's he got, what's he got to, well, he knows who my audience is. He knows they're skeptical of vaccines and so on. And he also knows they're asking hard, the good hard questions about the thesis statement. So what Paul basically said is this, you have these vaccines that with two doses actually provide tremendous immunity against severe disease for most of the population with the exception maybe of the very old and people with multiple, multiple comorbidities. So he sits on the advisory committees that actually look at FDA in the United States and uh, these sort of guidelines of how are we gonna approve this vaccine? What are we gonna do? So he's privy to all the raw information. And he feels very strongly that we are now promoting booster shots for young people when common sense dictates that young people are actually quite safe from the severe effects of the disease as it is, especially with the first set of doses. They, the, the vaccines are much less effective now against transmission when you're talking about Omicron. So the argument of like reducing transmission is less. And on top of that, he was one of the people who internally was arguing for the recognition of natural immunity when we're talking about things like mandates or passports or green passes or whatever. And he was basically shouted down. And so the fact that we don't recognize what is powerful immunity, we demand that young people, whether they're teenagers or college students, get three doses of a vaccine when in fact there is a very small risk with that third dose of myocarditis, especially in boys. So it's not a completely riskless thing. And his feeling is, we've taken such a hard line stance on this, you can't even deviate. Nobody is going to trust, like people who have common sense are gonna look at this and go, that's nonsense. And so now what's happening is it bleeds into childhood vaccines. Now the same people are saying, well, maybe the childhood vaccines were wrong. And you're gonna see resurgences of measles and polio and all these things. He's really at his wits end. Um, and he's worried that all his life's work about kids' vaccines is going to be undone by the the way we're behaving now. Yeah, and I want to kind of just bring us back to Rogan a little bit because the way the conversation is going on at the moment is really around. There's a lot of talk about censorship. There's a lot of focus on Spotify, and mm. I think both of us agree like censorship is the worst of all possible solutions. Just cr crazy in terms that it, it's never going to work. It's going to probably backfire with someone with such a huge platform as Rogan. But also what is required is the interesting question. I think so much of this focus being like just about on this sort of censorship binary is really boring to me. It's like, that's not the question we should be having. Yeah. The question we should be having is what could a healthy information ecosystem look like? Yeah, you're right. And, and the, I think the reason is there's no incentive. Like nobody has an incentive, a financial incentive to do that. You know, if anything, it's, it's, you know, being being in a position of synthesis or of um, that being that corpus callosum, you know, I call it the alt middle sort of perspective. It's not rewarded, actually. It's the quite the opposite in in the current ecosystem. So, censorship is an easy political way for people to say, well, big tech is the problem. They're giving these people a platform. We just need to have big tech turn them off. So let's go, uh, you know, get Spotify to behave itself, and let's have you know, you know. Per artists, like musical artists with particular um, longstanding political beliefs stand up and say, I'm gonna take my stuff off of Spotify and, and put pressure on them to just basically silence them. Anybody with a shred of common sense knows you don't silence anybody now. You know, you, you just don't. The, the, way, the way you silence someone is you thoroughly discredit their ideas with better ideas. That's the only way. And even then they're still gonna have a voice, but it's just gonna be smaller. 
right? Like the flat earthers don't have this massive outside voice that's threatening space travel because most people can look at those ideas and go, well, here's an actual picture of the earth and it's round. So, you know, there's ways to show truth or to find truth. So I agree. I think um, censorship is a terrible, so I'll tell you a quick story. So this morning I get an email from YouTube and it says, your video has been determined to violate our policies on COVID medical misinformation uh, and has been removed. You can appeal it here. And you know what video it was? It was a clip I used from my interview with Constantine and Francis on trigonometry. And it was, a tr it was the piece talking about the religious aspect that you've already spoken of, David, about COVID. And it was saying you have these these sort of the jihad of the vaccine, the vaccine people and the baptism of vaccine. And then you have the sacred sacraments of ivermectin and so on. It was something to that effect. They pulled it for misinformation. And here's the best part. Uh, Constantine and Francis's original interview with me was still up. So what's going on? So the, the interesting, so I did do the appeal. I went through the appeal uh, process and I have contacts at YouTube and I emailed them and I said, you guys, and today I got an email saying, okay, we determined that your video is good to go. So what's going on? Did a human being actually look at that and say, this is misinformation, let's pull it? Or was it an algorithm that misflagged it? Because it was up for quite a few days. So if it was an algorithm, it took a while. I don't know the answer, but all I know is, do you really trust YouTube to make that call? Like, no, you absolutely don't. If I didn't have contacts at YouTube, maybe the video would not be up. So that tells you that that the censorship is a, just a loser's, it's a fool's errand. Yeah. Yeah, we had something similar happen with our pieces about ivermectin in the summer and they were taken down and I think only were put back up because Matt Taibbi wrote an article about it. and It got, it obviously became a PR nightmare for them. Um, is it interesting that you mentioned about kind of there is no market for synthesis? And I think that's really true. And I mean, I, I really respect Joe Rogan. I've watched him for quite a long time. I've seen him push back in, in the fascinating film that um, Timber on Toast did about Dave Rubin, who I think Dave Rubin is, is less of a um, good actor than, than Rogan. He's more of a political actor. Whereas Rogan, they showed him do really good work with someone like Candace Owens, with someone like Stefan Molyneux. He genuinely pushed back against them. And I think Rogan is kind of generally Ill oriented towards truth and certainly has been a lot in the past. The concern now that I have is when I look at something like Twitter and I see Joe, loads of people saying Joe Rogan is the only thing standing between America and tyranny. Joe Rogan is the, is the next president of the United States. Joe Rogan is published the truth last night with Robert Malone, Peter McCullough. Joe Rogan, like Rogan has, that would warp anyone. That would warp anyone to be that, like he has the potential of being kind of the king of the antithesis position and not challenging, not kind of going into, okay, well, how much of what Robert Malone said was true? How much of what Peter McCullough said was true? Maybe I should get other people on to kind of put the counterpoint. Like there are such huge forces pulling anyone and given them the fact that the kind of information landscape warps around all of us, who, how much must it warp around someone like Joe Rogan when you're exposed to that constantly? And it sort of feels like, where is the incentive to kind of turn around and challenge some of the, the perspectives? And we can maybe go into some of those specifics in a minute, kind of like maybe ivermectin or some of the other topics. But yeah, it's it's such a warping landscape if you look at it from the kind of the bigger picture. Yeah, you know, it is. And Joe actually said like, listen, the kind of things I do are what made my show what it is. And I don't really intend to not do those things. And I think some of it is he goes with his own curiosity and his own biases on certain things. Like if he has Paul Stamets on, they go deep on, you know, psilocybin and mushrooms and, you know, the crazy trips that Paul had in a tree where lightning strike, and, you know, and, and people who are interested in that stuff think it's just the greatest thing ever. But Joe is not, you know, I don't know that he's going to have somebody on who's, um, 
saying that psilocybin can trigger psychosis in susceptible people, you know, whatever it is. I don't know what the science is on that, but he wouldn't, I don't know that that would drive his curiosity enough to have somebody on that show. So he's gonna go with what he's interested in, which, hey, that's absolutely okay. Then the question becomes as a responsible heterodox space, how much does he assume the role of a mainstream type media and with those responsibilities? That's the question that, that, that you could almost, look, let's say that, and I'm sure we'll talk about Joe's statement on Instagram. But my point of doing this is always just to create interesting conversations and ones that I hope people enjoy. So if I pissed you off, I'm sorry. And uh, if you enjoy the podcast, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you to Spotify. Thank you all the supporters. And, and even thank you to the haters because it's good to have some haters. It makes you reassess what you're doing and put things into perspective. And, and uh, I, think, I think that's good too. But you know, when I watch that, first of all, you can make two assumptions. You could say that he was somehow coerced into that by Spotify or by pressure, by very direct, like, listen, either do something or something bad's gonna happen to what you're doing. So that's the cynical take. Or you could make the assumption that Joe actually listens when you know a lot of people say something and there's probably some truth to what they're saying in his mind. And he's then processing it and saying, I don't know, I don't know the best answer. I'm telling you that, you know, I'm sorry that Spotify had to go through all this because it is a drag for them. They're getting attacked. You know, I like Neil Young, I like Joni Mitchell, you know. So he, he did what I think a good person would do in that situation and say, hey, this is my position and this is what I'm thinking about. And maybe I'll get more people who disagree on the show. And so, that's probably, you know, how can you distinguish between those things? Like how much of it is he's captured by whatever it is that he's doing and how much of it is just, he's a normal guy who has an abnormal reach, who's trying to do the right thing. You know, it's very hard to tease out. Whenever we talk about this kind of, I think as creators, as content creators, you and I know we have these conversations all the time. And I think all content creators feel this sort of tension in themselves, and certainly the ones who are trying to do an ethical job, we have this conversation all the time. I have it with a lot of other content creators as well. I think all of all of them take it very seriously. When we talk to people, um, or when, when people kind of respond to it, viewers respond to it, I think often they kind of say, oh, you're just bringing in gatekeeping. You're just trying to establish new gatekeeping rules or your BBC Channel 4 background. We don't need it here, that kind of stuff, which I understand that perspective, but what I think people don't understand is that every single decision that is made is a gatekeeping decision. Yeah. Every single decision to have someone on or have someone else on, the kind of questions that you're asking them, the way that the interview is framed is a gatekeeping decision. There, isn't so, there, there is no decision that is not a gatekeeping decision. And if you listen to that conversation that Joe, sorry, the, the statement that Joe made on Instagram, I, I, he recognized that. Like there was definitely the sense that he was someone who recognized that he his reach and his influence came with obligations. He's still trying to work out what those are. And I think everyone is. I think that's also needs to be stated as well. Like I come from a mainstream background that has a certain set of rules and a certain set of kind of expectations that have built up over generations mostly. And much of the mainstream media has moved away from that and has kind of gone down a various different kind of ideological and um, institutional cul-de-sacs. But we are all now working out in the alternative space, like what are the obligations? What are the, the necessities? And I do think that if you see truth as something sacred, which is certainly a value that, that I think is very defensible, because if you're talking about influence and reality, then that I think is is close to a kind of sacred value. And I do get the sense that Joe does recognize that. What do you think he gets right and what do you think he gets wrong? Yeah. I think, you know, it's by the way that gatekeeping thing is real, right? Every decision you and I make, who we're having on the show, how we're going to frame it, how we're going to what thumbnail we're going to make, all of those are gatekeeping decisions. And um you know, because I get criticized a lot for why don't you have more mainstream doctors like Ashish Jha and Peter Hotez and these other guys. And, and it's interesting 
so uh, Joe, Joe Rogan actually says, oh, I had Peter Hotez on prior to the pandemic. Okay, well, that I don't know that that counts. I had Peter Hotez on prior to the pandemic too, um, but I made a conscious decision not to ask him to come back. Why? That's gatekeeping because I feel like he's presenting a very clear mainstream picture that is available in lots of different mainstream outlets. And in a way, my gatekeeping comes around, let me show voices that aren't normally heard that aren't crazy in my mind, in my mind, right? So that's gatekeeping. So what is Joe doing? He's doing the same thing. He's probably like, well, you know what? I'll get Sanjay on because Sanjay reached out and it was a nice conversation and we had a good conversation, but he's not necessarily so interested in you know, a Paul Offit, he might be interested in a Vinay Prasad or a Marty McCary, but but when even when Joe was talking about, well, okay, so to my defense, Joe said, you know, I, I had Hotez on, I had Sanjay Gupta on, um, and I, I don't know that that's a very strong argument for having the counter argument on. Um, I think uh, if 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 he were held to sort of what the classic, the old school media might have been held to, he would have a series of different guests with a range of opinions on it. But I don't think we've really seen that. So then where is he held accountable for that? I mean, he's clearly introspecting. Like my take, remember I said there, here was a cynical take, here's the, I actually am with the authentic Joe take. Like I actually think he's really introspecting on this and is working it out and is basically saying, hey guys, like this is the thing. Um, but yeah, I, I, I just, you know, short of like a some kind of structured code, which is kind of anathema in the heterodox space. Like the reason they're in that space is we, we don't, we haven't had to worry about those kind of things, but now with the prominence of it, and you know, the truth is people say, oh, you know, the, the thesis side really hyperbolizes around, you know, you're killing people and so on. But I, I'll tell you, like, if, 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 if you're giving an unopposed Malone and McCullough a voice without giving, because I get the emails, right? So they come to me, hey, can you help us understand this because we haven't seen the other side of this? Well, I'm just one guy and there's, it, it'd be great if Joe could actually put on some put on someone who would give that nuanced thing because people choose things about their health based on what they're seeing. Now, what the guys on CNN were saying about Doritos and all that, that's just horse crap. Like, come on guys, like you're, no. We just need to say, there's one opinion being shown, let's show another side. Um, and that's that's not, I don't think it's rocket science to do that, you know? One other thing, David, so when, when you know, so Sam Harris, I did a piece looking through McCullough and I wanted to be as fair as I could. I put my biases out there and I have biases, right? Um, and I thought, okay, here's the piece. And hopefully people will look at it with a reasonable uh, framing. And Sam Harris tweeted it, um, but his framing was, hey, for anyone who got brain damage watching the Rogan piece with McCullough, here's the antidote. Thanks, Z-Dog. And I was like, oh man, like that's not how I, I would frame it because <laughs> that wasn't my intent. I wasn't there to go, oh, pe this guy is totally brain damaged. You know, So it is like, it kind of, the passions run high, but I would love to just see some more synthesis framing, even of synthesis pieces. Yeah. And this is where I get really interested as well, because for me, this whole thing, the, the, the goal in this whole thing could be, is it possible for the kind of heterodox space to, to grow up in a way? Mm. Uh, the heterodox space is all about criticizing the mainstream institutions, but is there a way of demonstrating something better? For example, I mean, there's a lot of people with, like Joe Rogan's got a lot of money. He's got contacts with a lot of people in the journalistic industry. Could he fund or work together in kind of hosting some of these dialogues that we're not seeing happening between some of these people who are equipped to challenge them? And also maybe funding some investigative journalism as well, like looking into some of the claims that are being made and demonstrate a better way of doing things. If we're constantly criticizing the mainstream institutions for their failures, I think at some point, the heterodox space should be prepared to kind of demonstrate a better way of doing things. And I'd hope that that, that, for, me is, that for me is a more grown-up place for the conversation to go. My, my friend Max Borders talks about criticize by creating, mm. which I think is a fabulous perspective to mm. say, okay, criticism is cheap. Creating alternatives, that's where you really start to, to kind of put your money where your mouth is. 
I, I, I really strongly agree with this because, uh, you know, Vinay Prasad and I do a podcast together and it's a pretty heterodox thing, you know, in the sense that we get plenty of messages from doctors who are like, listen, we can't even talk like you're talking because we'll get ostracized in our own facilities because there's this group think going on. And the idea that uh, the heterodox space can actually create a way of, 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 of conveying information, of having conversations that is so good that people will listen to different opinions in a way that's open that is the best way to respond to criticism. And Vinay will say, listen, because he gets crapped on by doctors on Twitter constantly, the sort of thesis people. Um, and you know, what he'll tell me is, listen, like these guys are welcome to start a really good podcast, to be communicators, to state what they say clearly and openly with a context and nuance in a one hour show that provides a wraparound context but they don't, they either can't, they don't have the ability, they don't have the talent, they don't have the time, they don't have the drive, or they don't realize how important it is. So instead they take a big whole thing, like a one, two hour podcast that we'll do, and they'll pull a tiny clip out of context and attack it. It's a, it's a kind of straw manning, right? Because you're missing the whole right hemisphere uh, uh, relational matrix that that piece was in. And I know a lot of people who feel very strongly about Vinay. They're like, I really don't like that guy, you know? Why do they feel that way? Oh, they follow him on Twitter and he's very aggressive in very short bites on Twitter. But then he'll, they'll watch a video with him and I or listen to a podcast and they'll say, oh, you know, he seems deeply caring and nuanced in his thinking and clear in his thinking and focused in his criticism. Well, that's, that's what you're talking about, David, is create to criticize, like make that, thing that people would then listen to and go, okay, now that that's more persuasive. Even if I disagree, at least I understand this is a good person. I can actually assume good intent, good faith, and so on. I don't think Twitter's a great place for that. No, no. But I, I do think that um, Rogan, of all people, I think is, is positioned to be able to kind of bring in what do those alternative institutions look like? I think, I think we're uh, yeah, I'd, I'd love to see that that could be one of the kind of positive solutions that comes out of this. Um, although I do think that my experience has been that the Malones of this world are pretty loath to, and, and a lot of people in this kind of extreme sort of more conspiratorial zone were not interested in debate, um, ironically, because they're, they're often kind of position themselves as, no, we're, we're, we're the ones that want to have the conversation, but I don't think they are. No. I, I can confirm they aren't. <laughs> I'll just say that. Um, not in any meaningful way, right? Not without a lot of rules that would make it skew entirely to the to the way that you can't even have properly the conversation. And, and I, it's a problem, right? Because people who really put their trust in folks like that are screaming for debate. And they're hearing the words that these guys are saying, saying, hey, we'll debate anybody. But the truth is they will not. And so even if you were to find somebody who's willing to overlook the old school thinking of false equivalence and giving somebody a platform that's they assume is crazy and so on, um, even if they're willing to overlook that, the, the debate doesn't happen because I think some of these actors are just not willing to do it, not willing to be directly challenged. I think the thing that I've felt covering this since the summer. And I don't think if you hadn't sort of paid this kind of close attention to it, people would appreciate like how small a group of people this is. Yeah. And they all know each other. They're all involved. They're all financially involved with each other as well. You're yeah. talking Steve Kirsch, Pierre Corey, Robert Malone, Robert McCullough. It's a small group of people. And the way that I look at and I've kind of been tracking it. I've been tracking it sort of. And then when they turned up on Rogan and they turned up on the Dark Horse in the summer, and I kind of was looking at it pretty closely there. A lot of the claims around ivermectin were made at that time. And then they sort of, it, it's now kind of in the big league because they turned up on, on Rogan. That's kind of how I'm looking at Rogan now. I can understand how he's ended up where he's ended up, for sure, just looking at the landscape. And I see it more as kind of having almost fallen in with the wrong crowd than, yeah. than anything else. Because you listen to him and he talks about, like he's still in contact with Pierre Corey, who he, co who he hosted about ivermectin. And without wanting to go too deeply into the details, if you look at things like 
the story around Uttar Pradesh that just falls apart as soon as you look at. And if you look at the Japan story as well, that just doesn't really add up. And you've seen these people kind of coalesce around particular narratives. They've got this kind of, they all, they're all coalesced more or less around the same narrative, which is about kind of drugs being suppressed, about medics being all kind of conspiring in some way. These don't really add up. If you start looking at them, you kind of realize that it starts to fall apart pretty quickly. I think it it's very hard if you don't have particular training in looking at evidence and data and things like that. But but see, the point you made about this is a small group of people. I mean, that's tr absolutely true. It's It's a tiny, tiny, tiny group that is having this really outsized effect. And the reason is that there's a large group of population that is fed up, that really doesn't trust mainstream. And so Joe's role here, it's we have we have a term in in science stochastic there's a stochastic relation so stochastic basically means it's a kind of random thing that happened where he fell in with that particular group and they are they are so deep in that worldview that it's very hard to escape unless someone comes and really goes through carefully with you and you know somebody like Sanjay Gupta is not that guy Sanjay Gupta is like a communicator, you know, he's not that guy. It's like a Paul Offit who is very smart, but also very reasonable and also very sympathetic to different viewpoints. Um, or a Vinay Prasad, who's actually very sympathetic to aspects of antithesis. Um, and, and unless you do that, you're going to continue down that particular rabbit hole. And Joe even says it, it's self-reinforcing. So celebrities ask him, hey, what should I do about COVID? And he's like, well, here's what I did. And it's kind of, it, it creates this kind of standing wave um, of, of echo, which look, we're all, we, we all have that. We're all prone to that, but I think, someone in Joe's position, and you can kind of feel it in the clip that he did on Instagram, are they have the capability of self-reflecting into their own bias. And I think once you see it, you can open to having other people there, but sometimes that requires help. It requires people telling you gently like, hey, you know, have you considered your, your own audience capture, your own bias or your own whatever it is, right? Like you and I, when we talk offline, we're always talking about, okay, is there any audience capture here? Like, do we care what our comment sections look like when we talk to each other? Like those kind of things are, are legitimate questions for a lot of creators that they don't ask. Like, I, I don't know if Brett, is, Brett Weinstein is asking those, those questions. I, I just don't know. Mm. Yeah, and I guess you could also look at it as a kind of like, uh, battle for the soul of Joe Rogan. I kind of thought about it like that at some point because he is this unique figure within the landscape that his decisions mean a lot. And I, it also makes me wonder because he's a good people person as well. Like he understands how, what makes people tick. And I think uh, you, you saw him like that with, with some of McCullough's points in particular where McCullough kind of was like, oh, I've looked at all of these. You can't get COVID twice. I've looked at all of them. And Joe was like, no, Just I'm like, not sure about that. Yeah. Um, and there were other moments as well, even with Malone, where you could kind of see him kind of thinking about it. And you start, to, we've talked about this offline, and I talked about a little bit in the piece that I put out about the religions of the pandemic, which is you can't avoid getting into territory that starts to feel a lot like ad hominem. And it feels unfair to do that because we're trying to keep it on the, the level of the factual. And I've tried to do that as well with kind of like taking apart some of the claims around ivermectin and around some of the other kind of claims to do with the vaccines, which is like spike protein peaks in your ovaries. Well, no, that was based on one tiny rat study where they injected them with a huge amount that they didn't find any, any issues with the ovaries anyway. And they then took out all of the other organs in the graph that they showed on the Dark Horse podcast. Like it, it just sort of falls apart once you start looking at it. But the thing that also you can't get away from is someone like Pierre Corey, someone like Robert Malone. Robert Malone freely admitted, his wife admitted that he had PTSD from being cut out of the story of the vaccines and feels like deeply personally wounded by not being part of this story. Pierre Corey, we had Eric Osgood on talking about when he appeared in front of the Senate uh, committee, I think it was Ron Johnson, and Osgood tells a beautiful story about how he was surprised to see Pierre Corey, who he respects as a doctor, alongside a lot of these other fringe doctors at this kind of 
fairly politicized hearing, but then the Democrats walked out of the hearing, which radicalized Corey. And he said he saw a real shift in Corey at that point where he became radicalized and bought into the narrative around ivermectin. And then you saw him on the Joe Rogan podcast, basically claiming that ivermectin was 100% effective as a prophylactic based on a study that was then retracted. Like All of this stuff starts to add up. You can't take out the human factor that this is what is driving an awful lot of this story. You dived into that in your piece on the religious wars, and it was something that stuck with me because the ad hominem thing is such a interesting piece. You, these are human beings making human making scientific claims. So someone like Corey is a great example. So he's a fellow physician. Like, look, there's a lot that you could dive into about how physicians think and how we are. Okay, and I'll just tell you as a rule, and th and again. You can take this as ad hominem, or you could take this as, hey, since we're humans, we better look at the human aspects of our own frailty, right? Doctors make a lot of errors, and a lot of them have to do with these sort of shorthand heuristics we use to think. But those are compounded by our absolute failure of introspection, <laughs> our inability, our complete conditioning to repress, deny, and project emotion, to not really introspect and see why we're behaving the way we are, to recognize why we have certain biases and so on. So whatever happened to Corey, I don't know what it is, but it would not surprise me if any physician in that position would come away completely radicalized and internalize that and then have a mission to prove that they're correct. So I'm not saying that's what happened to him, but that that is totally in keeping with a human's behavior, particularly a physician. So Malone, same thing. The guy invents this one little piece of a big puzzle that Paul Offit actually unwound a bit. Now here's the thing he did and here's the rest of the puzzle. And when you listen to that, you go, okay, so now it's perspectivized. Now, could he feel his wife, his wife said he felt, you know, left out of this thing. Would How would that affect somebody who may not have the highest degree of emotional intelligence or introspection, who's a very science-minded guy, maybe even who knows, you know, how his mind works? He's brilliant. He's a super smart guy. So what is, w there are different lines of intelligence. You have the emotional intelligence, introspection, then you have Intel, you know, the more classical intelligence. So how will that affect a person like that? Will it turn them into somebody who goes with a straight face, believes what they're saying deeply? That's why people trust these guys because they're actually not lying in their mind. Um, they're lying to themselves. And that's why, that's how humans can deceive each other. When we lie to ourselves, we believe our own thing. And then our facial expressions are consistent with truth. So. That's what I really wonder, and it's, it's, is that not inappropriate to ask, especially when somebody like Malone makes an ad hominem statement like, hey, you know, these frontline physicians, hospitalists, that's my profession, um, are really colluding to keep patients in the hospital longer by promoting vaccines and not promoting ivermectin, hydroxychloroquine. Okay, well, that's an ad hominem attack because you're basically saying they care more about money than they care about human lives. So we can't respond to that by questioning his own motives. I, I don't think that's fair. Yeah, this is another point that I tried to get across in the religions piece, which is this: there's a dividing line you often find when you're talking to people who kind of uh, were arguing for what Robert Malone said or Peter McCullough said, where th because they're not medically trained, they're not aware of this dividing line between the, you can't trust big pharma, you've got to kind of be aware of the profit motive in the health industry, you know that kind of, you don't trust these. And then there's the flipping over into, and therefore doctors in hospitals are doing these things. And it's like, you flipped from a kind of societal conspiracy, which is clearly true, like that that you, you can't trust the incentive structures in so many different industries to, and therefore the doctors themselves are in on it. This also came home to me a lot when I was speaking to Rocky Jeddick, the, um, the ER doctor in um, Salt Lake City. He was saying, I've got patients coming in to see me who are telling me they don't trust me, who are telling me that they basically believe that I'm not giving them certain drugs because I'm being paid for this, that it's made doctors' jobs incredibly difficult because of these, these claims. Yeah, that's absolutely true. And those are the emails I get. Like, you know, patients are saying this and that because of something they saw on Rogan. So this, this again, it, it it's, um, 
that switch from, you know, this is possible, you know, yes, the system is completely backwards. I mean, I've been yelling about this since 2010, basically, um, to, oh, everybody's in on it. Well, if you practice, and I'll tell you, and I, I told this on, I said this when I interviewed Paul Offit, like this idea that hospitalists, like people like me, that are drowning in patients at work, that are often salaried, so it doesn't matter whether we have one patient. In fact, we want one patient. We don't want 21 patients um, because then the, you know, the per pay patient is better. That's our incentive, right? So we want people to be healthy, stay out of the hospital. That's a good incentive structure. That's why there many hospitalists are salaried. It makes no sense with what they're saying. So, but now people believe that because intuitively they know pharma has these in, uh, these cost structures. Hospitals have cost structure and incentives that that are backwards. So, it when the rubber hits the road in the emergency department or whatever, the patients are belligerent, they're mistrustful, and with good cause, they've been kind of radicalized. And again, it comes down to our human inability to hold all these things in our head at once, all these different angles and true as things as true but partial. We don't typically do that. We have to make a quick heuristic left brain decision and go with it. Um, and so Rocky, Rocky on your show, I think was one of the most compelling voices that spans into thesis because he's telling you what they're actually seeing right? And I hear this a lot from my colleagues and it's interesting. So my colleagues every now and again, will try to turn the screws on me. Hey, can you be a little more aggressive with telling people they got to go get vaccinated? They got to not listen to Rogan. They got to do all this. And I'll tell them, uh, yeah, I could do that. And then you could make the problem worse because then they are going to, they, they, they're not seeing the nuance and the acceptance of actually what their concerns are. And I'll explain to them and they'll say, oh, that's true. I don't have the time to do that in the emergency department or in my clinic. I have to be very concrete. The CDC says this, I need to tell you this because I've got 30 more patients to see. It's a pure logistics nightmare. So I tell them, I have all the time in the world. I'll do a three hour show on whatever. Um, and you can share it with your patients, but it's a real challenge, man. Um, and th I think that's part of the thing that I think a lot of people don't see is what it's like to be a doctor in that in that mill. And people like Corey and others are really resented by people on front lines because they go, this guy's really warping our, he's making our jobs harder. Peter McCullough, same thing when he says things like, there's only, there's only 500 doctors that really know how to treat COVID in the United States. It's like, so the other uh, 950, 990 odd thousand don't know what they're doing. I mean, that's a direct attack on the profession. Mm, yeah. And this was something as well, like you do get this sort of, I think another kind of low, low information take that you see a lot is that, oh, Malone and McCullough are speaking up on behalf of doctors, which again was the opposite that I found in the summer. Like I was inundated with doctors, medical professionals, many of whom were sort of former fans of people like Brett Weinstein and the IDW saying, I don't know what's happened. I don't know what's going on. Please 